the, on video. Um, so uh, when I upload this, you'll see what it will look like. You will see my version, not this version of this. Okay, so um, let me just uh, proceed a little bit. I want to talk a little bit, introduce myself a little bit, and uh, um, people in the back hear me okay, or do I need to use a mic? Don't be shy. Do you need me to use a mic in the back row? Yes, no? Yeah, okay. Then uh, hopefully, there we go. If you're using the mic ever, um, if I decide to let you do it live, or if I come up to you and point the mic at you, um, you have to speak right into it. Or you do like this, you can't hear it. But it's very directional. Okay, so I will use the mic now. Um, I don't really care why you call me, <clears throat> uh, as long as it's not bad. Um, I consider myself more of a professional than a professor, although I am a full professor and I have taught for some 20 years, more than 20 years. I'm also always involved in the profession of communications. Uh, I was uh, right out of college. I was hired to be an editor of a, of a large uh, uh, big city newspaper, a weekly newspaper, 120,000 circulation. Um, I was kind of surprised by that. I was actually thinking I'd go into education immediately. I was planning to stay in college a little bit longer. And one of my um, one of my college professors had a friend who was starting a new newspaper in Tampa, Florida, and he, he had been asked for somebody who he thought could do the job of a professional editor, and he suggested me, of all things. So at uh, age 23, I became an editor of a newspaper. Um, I left that job, and we'll get into the reason maybe later talk about that in, in the as it relates to achieving success. About two years later, I bought my own publishing company. And so I became a publisher at age 25. Uh, within two, within actually a little over a year, I doubled its revenue. And in two years, I sold it uh, and took my profits and went back and decided the best investment at that time in my life was to invest in myself. And so I got my master's degree. And I started doing a lot of research. I was, it turned out that I was really good at research too. I didn't know that. <laughs> at the time, um, and so I had a lot of research published while I was doing my master's degree in, uh, in some of the top tier of journals in America. And so at age 30, I was hired to be a professor, of all things. Um, but I left, uh, after four years of being a professor, I decided I wanted to go back in the industry, and so I went back. I did a lot of kind of double dipping, so to speak. Um, when I was uh, then 36, I became an editor at a, at a 50,000 circulation daily newspaper, uh, which was an important part of my prof professional background. But at the same time, I was running a journalism program for a local college. And uh, that was also very important, uh, very, uh, very enjoyable experience. And so I, I kind of double dipped a lot of different places. Uh, uh, including during that time. And so when I say I have over 30 years of experience in the profession and over 20 years in, in academics, that doesn't mean I'm 100 years old, but I'm getting there fast. So anyway, as it, all that was to say, as a professional, if I walked into a newsroom and said, call me Dr. Ken, um, or call me professor or whatever, you know, hey, no, that doesn't work in a newsroom. They'd probably throw me out a window. In fact, I did some of my research was the relationship between academics, the uh, journalism academics and journalism professionals. And I asked the professionals, if you had a choice of hiring somebody with a PhD or somebody with a master's degree, everything else being equal, which one would you hire? And most of them would hire the person with the master's degree. They didn't want the person with the PhD on the place. Um, and so if I ever decide to go look for a job back with newspapers, I'm taking PhD off my CV uh, because that'll count against me, not for me. So um, I don't mind just being called Cam. 
I, I, some, I know it's hard for a lot of my students. Some of my very best students I've ever had refused to do that, uh, even after they graduated. They still refuse to say, call me Ken. Um, Ken is my first name, by the way. Uh, my family name is Harvey. Some people have trouble with Harvey uh, as I've worked around the world. And so I, most people will call me Dr. Ken by default. They will feel like they have to call me Dr. or Prof. Ken is fine. Professor Ken, Prof. Ken, Dr. Ken. I really don't care. Uh, just fit in Ken somewhere in there. Um, and I'll know who you're talking to. So like I say, uh, actually, yeah, this is all overlapping. So this does kind of add up to about 100 years. Uh, you know, 25 years as a reporter and editor and publisher, 20 years in teaching, 15 years in marketing and PR, four years as a government official, 20 years in web creation and management. Um, I am old, but not that old. I mean, I, a lot of overlapping stuff. This is one of my latter newspapers. It was, uh, the idea going into it was to have a, this was in 2006, I guess, or seven or five, maybe 2005, was to have a, was to try to uh, hit the, the new curve, so to speak, which we'll talk about uh, in achieving success is looking to the next curve. And so the attempt here was to start a, a, a newspaper magazine that was only mostly in print, but have a daily online content. And uh, it got kind of fouled up along the way. Uh, didn't uh, go quite the way I wanted it to. And a little bit early, and I was competing against a, a monopoly daily newspaper uh, owned by the top chain, the biggest chain in, of newspapers in America. And so, uh, but it was a good, uh, good effort. And uh, I, we did, I also uh, ran this newspaper, and this one's still going. The Entertainer newspaper. It's like a specialty magazine. It's a monthly publication, but for just for local, uh, you know, primarily for local entertainment uh, and activities. And that one is still prospering. Uh, so I sold that one uh, when I decided to go back. When I got my PhD, finally, I didn't get my PhD until I was until 2008, which would have made me 58 years old. Um, so that's when I got my my PhD and decided to go back into teaching. I do online blogging. This is one of my sites. One of my pet peeves in current journalism is that um, that it's very one-sided. And so on this blog here, on the left are all the liberal American or international media. On the right are the conservative media. And I give my opinion in the center. Um, but in my opinion is biased like everybody's is. Um, before I came here, I was working in Kazakhstan. I took that job in 2008 and uh, at an English speaking university there. And uh, I, as I said, I, I no, never totally withdraw myself from, from the profession. So somebody came to me and they wanted to start a, uh, by the way, I guess I should say uh, in 2001, one, uh, I won a contract with the state of Washington. So, and that contract was to print a a uh, quarterly publication for the state about migrant and bilingual education. Uh, it was to be a bilingual publication in English and Spanish. And so I won that contract. And as part of that, I had to have a nonprofit organization. What in this part of the world is usually called a non-government organization. And so I I've been the founder and the the president of a nonprofit this whole time too. But when I was in Kazakhstan, then somebody came to me and they wanted to have a conference and to produce a book about the basically the best practices of, of non-government organizations in Central Asia. And uh, they wanted to do it one time. And I started, I thought, you know, we talked about it and I said, uh, I'm willing to do it, but not one time. Uh, if we do this, this is a good enough idea supporting non-government organizations that I want to do it forever, uh, or at least set it up so it can be done forever. And so that was ten, more than 10 years and $10 million ago, because we got lots of funding uh, after that. And we 
we've we produced uh, 10 books and we now have online education uh, for non-government organizations throughout all of Central Asia, from Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan and Tajikistan and Kurt, what are, Kyrgyzstan and all the way over to Azerbaijan. Um, so that's the way I think, by the way. I, I always think how to have the biggest impact. And that's part of, of success strategies we'll talk about is how can I be more proactive? How can I have bigger impact? And so that was my perhaps my biggest impact in Central Asia was this project, and it, for which I never made a penny. Uh, so you have to kind of decide what success is. And it has to do with making money. This wasn't making. Uh, but it was a good, a good uh, project. So you see, uh, you see some Russian on there along with the English. So everything was bilingual with that also. I do a lot of online videos uh, and I do my own websites. This is uh, part of a website, uh, iei-tv.net. Um, there's kind of some professional, um, it was, well, it was research about how to help professionals. And so I still maintain it. I haven't, um, I haven't updated it lately. I'm actually thinking about doing some new stuff with it in the near future. But the idea was, uh, I started experimenting, you know, 10, uh, probably 12 years ago with using video online and how to best do it and started doing a lot of embedding. So I wanted to see how many embeds I could make on a page, on a standard web page without it blowing up basically. And so I tried putting like a hundred on one page and yeah, it wouldn't start up. Um, so I started using this one and I, each of these sections, um, in case you're not seeing my, uh, anyway, uh, each of these sections actually goes to a different web page. So this looks like active videos, but they're not. And so I could put a hundred photos of active of pages of uh, YouTube and TED.com type videos on one page and then uh, when you click that, it takes you to another page with active uh, active uh, embeds and so forth. Anyway, so I did that. Um, on there, I have uh, a bunch of my own videos and you see links to all sorts of stuff that I, again, I haven't updated it lately, but I see some future application to it professionally. Um, this was the state uh, uh, contracted bilingual newspaper that I put out uh, quarterly uh, about, again, about bilingual and, and uh, uh, migrant education. Migrants are the lowest achieving students in America uh, because first off, they mostly come speaking Spanish, maybe Russian, uh, there are other languages too, but most of them are Spanish speakers. They may not know any English yet. They show up at a school and say, here, teach me. And they don't know English. Um, they also, because they're migrants, they're working in the fields in America, so their families may move four times a year. So they get started in a school and then they move and they get started in another school and they move and they get started in another school and they move. And schools in America are not coordinated. What one school teaches, another school does not teach. And so you're in the middle of, you know, you start a class and you move to another, another school and they're not even teaching that class. And, uh, the system was trying to help them to carry some credits over and maybe finish the class online. So I helped them with the online curriculum as well uh, to help the migrants to get some credit for the work they'd done, uh, even if they didn't finish the class. Uh, however, they had to, however we could help them. Um, I went into, uh, in the 90s, I spent a lot of the 90s in, uh, as a marketing director. Um, uh, marketing PR director. I worked for uh, engineering consulting firms prim primarily, um, although actually my contract with the state of Washington is, was a PR job since I was producing, you know, PR basically for the state of Washington. They might not call it that, but that's what it was. Um, anyway, uh, so these, uh, with an engineering firm, uh, in order to, to try to get a million dollar project or a $10 million project or a $100 million project, I had to create books this thick, uh, telling them why they should hire us. And most of the time, we would at least get the interview. 
competing against lots of other companies that also want a million dollar contract or a $10 million contract. Um, who wouldn't want that? Um, so I had to make really nice books, basically book presentations to send in, and then they would give us an interview, and that's where the, they'd make a final decision. And we'd win somewhere between 20 and 30% of all the contracts we went after. So that was another part of my career. Uh, I also, uh, over on the left, that's me. You can't see the, co the commonality. But I, I became a city councilman, and I, I spent the least money of anybody, having learned how to promote myself ec uh, economically. I spent uh, uh, one fifth as much as as some of the opponents, and I won. I beat all the other all all the other candidates uh, by a lot by knowing how to do it, how to communicate. Over the right side, I was uh, running a campaign for, uh, this is way back in 1974. Um, I uh, helped the newspaper I was working at to get a contract with this political candidate. And he was, uh, there were eight people running for mayor of Tampa. He was number eight. And in one month, we brought him up to number two. And he won uh, about two thirds of the precincts uh, in the final exam, uh, final election by using what is now the most popular, I use the most popular form today, a uh, type of advertising, which we won't talk a lot about, but I just, so you know, um, the most, the, the fastest growing type of advertising on the internet now, which is the fastest type of advertising growing anywhere, is called native advertising. And native advertising tries to look like the content around it. So over on the right side, this is a page within a newspaper. This page was paid for. Um, up along, uh, down, you know, down the bottom here, it says, uh, I don't know, I can't read it. It should say something like paid political ad. At the top, of course, uh, in every column, you also all types of paid political ad, paid political ad, paid political ad, paid political ad. But most people who read, read this page didn't know it was a paid political ad. Uh, that's native advertising. Kind of deceptive, but again, it brought my candidate from number eight among eight candidates to number two in one month, and in another month, won two thirds of the precincts by using this approach. So this is the most popular, not just in newspapers, but on if in uh, Facebook, for example, you see something that says sponsored, that's native advertising. They're trying to put their advertising in uh, within all of the uh, organic uh, content of Facebook. And, uh, and if they do a good job, you don't know that it's paid. You don't bother to read sponsored. Uh, you do, or if you do, you don't know what that means. That means somebody paid for it. It's an ad. Um, and so that's Facebook's most popular type of advertising and native advertising. So it's a different context. This was old style in a newspaper. Well, I was one of the first people to ever use native advertising, um, especially maybe the very first person to use it in political advertising. I don't know. They still don't use it very much. They should. Uh, this is part of a book I co-authored, and those are my, my particular chapters I wrote in a book. Um, and this is how I ended up here, is the, uh, the editor of that book uh, came here as a professor, and he recruited me to come join him because I had written about half of his book um, that he had uh, published. Okay, getting to another topic. How you learn, how you think. We are very, we're all defective in how we think. Um, that's pretty much proven. Um, it is proven, we're defective. We do the best we can. We try to figure out what the heck's going on around us. We are explorers in this life, and we're not really good at it. Uh, we start off, you know, as babies, pretty bad at it there, and we get probably worse. Maybe not, hopefully not worse, but we might be. Um, our minds are kind of like, I compare them to the, what we used, when I was a kid, we called an erector set. These, uh, 
it came, it was a whole bunch of pieces of metal, a whole bunch of screws and, and nuts, and you would build things like you see over on the right. You could build Eiffel Towers, you could build skyscrapers, you could build, uh, you know, bridges and so forth. Uh, and you, and that was kind of our version in the 1950s. They're still available, by the way, uh, in the 1950s of, of Legos. You know, it's a lot more work than Legos because we had to bolt them everything in one piece at a time. Um, if you were building that Eiffel Tower, though, you might start off with the four legs. Once you built the four legs uh, and just made one quick attachment, maybe up at the top, would that be a very stable structure? Four legs and a little tie at the top. What happened when you push it? It's kind of going to collapse, right? Doesn't have enough support. So those of you in engineering would know that's not a very good structure. Um, and that's the same with our minds. Each, our minds are built upon individual concepts, and we piece them together throughout our lives. Those concepts are the little little strips of metal, basically. When we start, it's very flexible, very very flexible. It's kind of like the Eiffel Tower, you know, with four legs, not very many crossbars, no diagonal bars, anything like that to, to support it. And so it's pretty easy if somebody hands you something, here, fit this in there. Well, yeah, we can figure out a way to fit that in there because it's, it's so uh, so flexible at that point. We fit almost anything in. But once we start putting crossbars and diagonal bars and everything and somebody hands us a piece, say, here, put this in, that yeah, doesn't fit. And in conceptually, when we're building our conceptual framework, that is officially called nonsense. If we can't fit it in, we don't fit it in. Once our, our conceptual structure is so strong, we have a hard time fitting new pieces in. Uh, the, the, there was a guy, if I hadn't tried to ask myself what his name was, I'd remember it. Uh, I have to come back. He'll come to me when I stop trying. But anyway, um, back in the 1950s, 19, early 1960s, uh, a guy wrote about scientific revolutions. And it's kind of almost the bedrock of research in America nowadays and around the world. He pointed out, for example, that almost, you know, in science, we have revolutions. You guys should know that. Uh, for example, they used to think the world was flat. Maybe a few people still think it's flat. But by and large, the world has gone on and decided, no, we have satellites, it's not flat. We know that now. Um, we used to think that that the uh, sun rotated around the Earth, along with the whole universe rotated around the Earth. We were the center of everything. After a while, we figured out, hey, that doesn't work so well. Um, the people who, who lead scientific revolutions are almost always young people. Why? Why would a young person have to lead a revolution scientifically? Because the old, fog old fogies like me have made their structures too strong and they just can't fit in these new concepts. They don't fit. And so to them, this new concept, this young guy comes up is nonsense. It does not fit. And so uh, we see time and again through history that people who lead scientific revolutions let alone social revolution and stuff, they have to, they start young and they build up a, a supporting cast. They point out this doesn't, this doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense. You know, the current uh, theories don't, don't, uh, they, there's too, too many anomalies. They don't answer, they don't solve the anomalies. We have to go after the anomalies, the things that don't fit into this theory. We have to figure out a new theory that answer that, that allows for an explanation of these things that don't fit these anomalies. And so um, gradually uh, a young person typically leads a revolution and it may take a lifetime to push the old guys out, push them aside and uh, to fulfill the revolution creating a new theory of whatever it might be. Um, well, we do that individually. We may not, they, they, we not, may not be scientists, but individually we kind of are, starting with babies, we are. We're explorers. We're trying to figure out what makes this world tick. How to, what's our part in this world? 
Um, and we may we have flaws. Uh, we we get to a point. In fact, they even did a test. They did an experiment recently where they took college kids, your age, or maybe a little bit older. They took college kids and they wanted to see which of the college kids would understand a revolutionary new idea. How many of them could could fathom and fit into their conceptual framework this revolutionary new idea? The ones who could were the stupidest students. <laughs> the smartest students had already made their conceptual framework too tight, too strong, uh, too rigid. They couldn't budget. They couldn't fit in this new concept. And so already at college age, we they and even and by the scientists, this revolutionary idea was true. So science had gone on to this new revolutionary idea. They were they were trying to teach to the the, the uh, college students. But the college students who had already learned the old concepts couldn't fit the new concept in. They were already resisting it. Their minds were, were already pushing it away. There's, there's a concept in psychology you may have heard of cognitive, cognitive dissonance. That's basically what we're saying. When somebody resists a new idea, they're basically, basically saying that new idea is nonsense. It makes no sense to me. And so they push it away uh, and they can't accept it. So, um, I guess I'm saying that in part to suggest you need to try, you need to really work hard. Because I, I try really hard to keep my mind as open as possible to new ideas. In fact, I my, one of my favorite things to do is to watch YouTube videos about quantum physics. I may not always accept everything they say, but that's just bizarre. That's bizarre. Uh, some of the top uh, quantum physicists are, they're actually doing research, million dollar research, on the idea that we are basically a video game. That we're not real. We think we're real. We're not really real. That somebody made us, uh, gave us enough self uh, reflection and so forth that we think we're real, but we're not. There's, there's highly, you know, highly thought of uh, quantum physicists who think that. And they have reason to think that, that they have, they have, they can back it up with their theories. But they think that we are somebody's video game and some, who knows, it could be God, it could be a teenager from some highly uh, sophisticated race of super beings that we can't understand, but that we're not real. That's, that's the thinking of some of the quantum physicists. Now, I try I don't accept that, and so I guess I'm saying I think that's nonsense. But, and maybe it's because I'm old and I'm too rigid, but I at least want to watch those videos and challenge my thinking uh, as to what the world is going on because quantum physics is mind-blowing. Uh, that's one of the most mind-blowing things you, you learn as a possibility in quantum physics, and they have reason to think that. They have reason to think that time does not exist. Um, and I won't go into the tests they do to do that, but they're fairly understandable once you understand how they how the, the experiments they did to prove basically that time doesn't exist. Uh, we just think it exists. And they have pretty good reason to think that we're not that we may exist in alternative universes. I also don't think that's true, but they have they have rationale behind it, they have science behind that. And so I like to challenge my mind with the most disruptive science possible so that it's a little bit easier for me to consider other things that are a little more normal. Um, so I would challenge you to do the same, is consider that you might be wrong, because probably you are, at least in some things. It's almost impossible that any of us is not wrong in something. In something fairly major that we think is right. Our culture in... Uh, is part of this this rigidity our culture tells us this is the way that people should live this is the way people should believe and that's part of our culture that is from the very start from our parents is being is part of this conceptual framework we're building and so it's, it's challenging it's self-challenging to force yourself to start thinking outside the box and thinking gee i might be wrong 
uh, I love my parents, but maybe they weren't right about this. Because every culture thinks it's right. Every culture thinks it's right. Every culture teaches its children that, that, that it's right. America, you know, China, Malaysia, you name it, whatever culture you're in, your culture is teaching you, you're right. That that culture is right. They're all totally different. They can't all be right. Um, so, uh, right from the very start, we're kind of being brainwashed in a sense by whatever, whatever culture we're growing, we're growing up in. So try to broaden your minds and 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 uh, understand where we're coming from. Now, um, see where we're at here. <clears throat> Mouse seems not be working. Okay. Um, now that kind of goes, however, on the one hand, you don't want to brainwash yourself. On the other hand, it's also part of memory. That's why our minds are defective. We remember by associating new information with old information. In other words, new concepts, we build on old concepts. And if we don't, we have a hard time remembering it because that association is what helps us remember. Our neural pathways are those conceptual, those pieces of metal linked together. And so uh, that's one reason why, you know, if you just hear me lecture, and that's all you do in this class is hear me lecture day after day after day, uh, in, in a few days, you're gonna forget everything I said. And because it hasn't been linked in there well enough. If on the other hand, I do a demonstration, uh, you get other things, maybe some support videos, whatever they help uh, give other perspectives of what I've been talking about by other lectures, uh, then you remember a little more. Uh, you actually remember the most if I make you do it. And so that's why you have a couple of things. You have a journal to reflect on what we're learning in class because you take time in the journal to think about what does this mean to me? How can I apply these principles in my life to be more successful? So you're linking it into your own conceptual framework. I'm not doing it for you. You're doing it. Uh, you also remember more if you, as a team, make an instructional video about one chapter in, in the book, College Success, because you're doing it. Um, so the more involved you are, the more you will remember what, is, what we teach and learn in this class. I would like you, by the way, when I ask for discussion, I'd like you to participate in discussion. If you say something, you'll remember a lot more about what happened in class. If you sit there and don't say anything, you're not engaged in, in, within your mind, you, you won't remember as much. That's just the way it is. The more involved you are, the better it embeds itself, the better it, you will allow it to attach itself. And you may go back, you know, say, you say, you know, just a couple of sentences in this class. What are you going to do? You're going to go back to your, you're going to leave the class and you're saying, oh, I should have said that better. I should have said it this other way. I should have, oh, or you might say, oh, yeah, people seem to understand it. That was really cool. You know, boy, I sounded profound. Wow. And then you start thinking about what you said in class. And during that whole time while you're thinking about it, it's embedding itself. It's like those, you know, those other, other uh, uh, pieces of metal being tied into your conceptual framework that wouldn't have tied in there. If you didn't take time to think about it and maybe express it, uh, it won't tie in. So the more you participate in the class in different ways, whether it's, you know, making a video, whether it's uh, writing in your self-reflective journal, whether it's just participating in discussion, I find it very, very difficult to get students at Scheinman to participate in discussion. Uh, you're all perhaps thinking, I'm gonna sound like an idiot. Uh, you might, <laughs> but uh, you'll still remember more. Even if you sound like an idiot, you'll be going back to your, uh, uh, your room and saying, oh, I was an idiot, I was an idiot. I should have said it this other way. You'll never forget that, okay? <laughs> you'll figure out how you should have said it and you'll remember that forever. Um, so even if you sound like an idiot, you'll remember it better. 
And uh, I do ask everybody to be respectful, and I won't call any of you an idiot if you say something that I disagree with. So participation is really important in education. Um, another thing that I believe is important, my philosophy of education, is that the number one thing, uh, the number one thing in your education is attitude, and I'll put in that also soft skills. Soft skills include a lot of attitudinal things uh, that we talk about when we talk about Stephen Covey's seven habits. His first habit, most important habit, the foundation of all the other habits, for example, is, is proactivity. What does that mean? What is proactive? We'll talk about it more in another class. What does proactivity mean? Anybody? Here's your chance to remember this. If you if you make a bad answer, it doesn't matter. You'll remember it better even if you make a bad answer. Anybody want to venture what proactive means? Uh, how do you feel that it compares to reactive? That's kind of a word. Proactive, reactive. What does reactive mean? If somebody punches you in the nose, what's the reaction? You punch him in the nose. That's right. Yeah. You're, you're, re you're responding to that stimulus in the way that you think is appropriate. Somebody punches you in the nose, you punch them in the nose. Proactive is not necessarily that. Proactive is making decision. Should I punch him in the nose? He's twice as big as I am. Uh, maybe I should be diplomatic and find out why he's punched me in the nose. Uh, I don't, you know, there's whatever you think is the appropriate logical thing to do when something happens to you is the proactive response. It's not the reactive response. Um, so that's, a, that's an example of it's an attitude, but it's also a soft skill. It's the first soft skill taught by Stephen Covey, is to not just react, but to consider the possible uh, responses and to be proactive. You make the choice. Uh, and those choices, and it's not always being punched in the nose. It could be, for example, uh, when I had that contract with the state of Washington, to prepare that bilingual uh, migrant education news. Uh, I was highly regarded. I have lots of letters of recommendation from my work there. Um, and every week, I, or every publication, every quarter, I would send out a copy of all the stories I was writing for about 14 or 15 people to look at and to give me feedback on. I wanted to do the best job possible. Uh, but as I sent those stories out, I would get responses, good job, 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 good job. And that felt good. I did a good job. But one day I wrote a story and one of, there was a gal in the administration of the state who was known to be the hardest, she was German. And German are kind of, Germans are kind of known as being kind of, kind of tough. And she was tough. She was in charge of all the, all the grant budgets. And if she didn't like how you were spending the state money, she would tell you what you know what you're doing wrong. And, all, and she was tough. A lot of people didn't like this woman. Um, and so I sent out my stories for a week for for the next edition, and it was good, good job, good job, good job. Even her boss said, "Good job, good job, good job, good job." And then there was, "No, you can't do this." What? I spent a lot of time writing that story. Well, she thought I was going to offend somebody. And uh, lots of places up towards the front here. I know that's embarrassing, but that's the way it is. Uh, feel free to come up, please. Um, here's three here, here's three here, three over there. Please come on up. Anyway, so here I had all this positive reaction. I had positive reaction from everybody, every edition, until this woman said, you cannot publish this article. Even though her boss said I could. Her boss said it was a great job. My boss, over her, said it was a great, great article. So what do you suppose my reaction was? My reaction was, okay, let's fight. <laughs> uh, I am a professional. You're a bureaucrat. You're, you know, you are an idiot. 
you know, you don't understand. Um, but, and I wrote the email telling her that basically, um, that she was absolutely wrong. Everybody else thought I was wonderful. Uh, we should publish this story just the way I wrote it. And then as I got done venting my frustration, I said to myself, maybe I better not send this tonight. Maybe I better wait till morning. And so I let my mind consider everything she said while I slept during the night, got up in the morning and said, darn it, she's right. And so instead of sending her that first email, I sent her an email saying, you know, I really appreciate that you are willing to give me constructive criticism. Everybody else said my article is wonderful. Everybody else says my articles are wonderful every time I write them. You're the one person who dared say no. You're the one person who dared say that this was something that could cause problems uh, for the department and that I needed to revise it. You're the only person who's done this. I really appreciate you doing that. I suppose her response would have been if I sent the first one as opposed to the second email. The first email would have just caused problems, right? I would have had an enemy overseeing my work at the in the State Department. The second one, because everybody hated this woman, because she didn't know how to say things diplomatically. She was very tough. And so everybody hated her. I don't know if she had a friend in the world. And so when I sent the second email, I became her best friend. Suddenly she was writing me emails about her trip to Europe and all sorts of stuff. And I, and it wasn't a romantic thing by any means. She's an old, tough German lady. And I don't know, you know, she, she was, it was not because she suddenly thought I was in love with her. She just suddenly had a friend. And she went ahead and later recommended me for uh, an increased contract and all sorts of stuff. She was my buddy now because I had dared to not be reactive instead be pre proactive, think about what she was talking about from her perspective, um, and wording my email very, very differently than what I felt the day before. Um, that gave me an ally instead of an enemy. So that's an example in my life of, of being proactive, of not being ready to punch it out. But thinking about it and considering, first off, is she right? Okay, that's the first thing I have to do is humble myself enough, thinking about our conceptual frameworks and everything, uh, and saying, is her perspective actually better than mine in this case? Am I wrong? That takes a little bit of humility to do that, to actually admit, and that's going back to your conceptual framework, is you're, you're built to think you're right. I did an experiment where I, I gave people a choice of three choices that there's no way they were supposed to predict the future. Uh, the future of American economics in 1978, 10 years later. What would it be like 10 years later? In economics, you should know you can't predict 10 years later. Uh, it's just too far. You can have a recession, you could be doing great, you could go, go through a recession, come out of the recession. You could be in a depression, you could be in a, it's virtually impossible, uh, even for a professor, to predict 10 years in the future in economics. Uh, the other one was, in 1978, to predict the future of the U.S.-Soviet relations. Soviet Union still existed for another 10 or 12 years, whatever it was. Um, and so I was asking journalists and readers to predict the future in 10 years. Not possible again. They didn't know who was going to be the next president. At that time, Jimmy Carter, who was one of the most nicest guys in the world, a terrible president, but a nice guy. Um, he was president at that time. There's no way to know in 1978 if he'd still be president in 1980. He wasn't. Well, he wasn't in 81. He was, he was uh, beat by Ronald Reagan. And if the people knew that Ronald Reagan was going to win, they might have a, also a different perspective because the liberals thought Ronald Reagan was going to start World War III. Nobody predicted the collapse of the Soviet Union. Nobody thought the Soviet Union was going to collapse. Nobody on earth. So there's no way 
that you could predict, you could give the right answer uh, absolutely on the question of what is the future of, of U.S.-Soviet relations? No way. So I asked those questions and asked them to predict, and then I asked them, how sure are you that you're right? What do you suppose the answer, the average answer was? How sure are people that they're right in making predictions about the future, even about economics and, and international relations? Anybody want to venture a guess? This is purely a guess. What do you think? If you had made that response, how sure are you, or how certain would you have been in making that response? You're younger, so you might not be quite as sure of yourself. The average was about 70%. It should have been 33% or 34%. Uh, maybe if you're really confident, maybe 40%. No way it should be 70% certainty that they're right. And among three options that are pretty much a wash. But that's who we are. That was hundreds and hundreds of people across the country, including journalists, uh, the, the journalists from the extremes of politics and the journalists in the middle and the readers of special interest mag political magazines that had strong feelings about things, and those of the general newspaper, all of them thought they were about 70% certain that they were right about what the future was 10 years in the future in economics and world relations. Yeah, well, they were wrong. I mean, they were. there's no way they knew. Uh, so that certainty was not warranted. It was like should have been about half of what they said, their certainty level should have been at least half of what they said. So anyway, so our conceptual frameworks is telling us that we're right. Even in making predictions of things that we really don't have any knowledge, you know, we, we're not smart enough. Even if, again, if you're a professor, if you're a professor of international relations asked to predict the future of US-Soviet relations in 1978, probably the majority would have been, not just the majority, Probably, well, I'd say it was at least two thirds likely they'd be wrong, at least two thirds. Instead, they thought it was 70% chance they were all right. Um, you know, what happened in the late 1980s and by 1988, nobody expected. It wasn't World War III, like the liberals thought, um, and, but it wasn't what the conservatives that supported Ronald Reagan thought either. The idea that the Soviet Union would collapse and say, okay, we give up. Nobody thought that. That was ridiculous. Nobody thought that. So I was lucky kind of in choosing that question that that's so absurd. So absurd that nobody could possibly think it. Nobody thought that. It was not within the realm of anybody's possibility that Soviet Union would say, we give up, you win. No. Anyway, um, so going back, uh, attitude, but there's other types of attitude that are important too, and, and other soft skills. Um, attitude includes work ethic. How hard are you willing to work for success? That's an attitude. Um, positive thinking. You know they've done, uh, gentlemen, there's some chairs up here. Um, there, they've done research, uh, positive attitude uh, correlates more to your success in life than your GPA? A lot more. A lot more. Your GPA has almost no correlation with success in life. None. Which is one reason why I don't mind, wouldn't mind giving you all A's. Because it really doesn't mean anything. Uh, if, if I give, you know, the, the, the people that I give A's to are almost certainly, I would say that their odds of being successful in life are absolutely no better than anybody else's. That's pretty much what research suggests. Uh, guess what the average GPA is of, well, they did a survey of 700 millionaires in America. What's their average GPA? Any thoughts? 2.5. Uh, 2.8. Very students. Um, so, you know, that's uh, uh, the 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 uh, researchers said basically it's rolling the dice from what they saw in their research. It's rolling the dice. Who would be successful? Who wouldn't be? Uh, but we as professors have no capability of predicting your future. 
you know, you are with us for a semester, we give you all sorts of tasks, give you all sorts of assignments, and we're no better at predicting your future of success than, than anybody. Uh, so, yeah, I don't mind giving everybody A's because it's no predictor. Your GPA is absolutely no predictor of your future. None. Zero. So, um, so you're being positive, even if you don't have a good memory, but you're positive. You're a positive person. Um, my brother uh, dropped out of college after one year. Loser, right? Loser. My stupid brother. Um, in high school, he was he he blew up the chemistry lab, uh, playing around with chemicals. Um, he if he wasn't doing something like getting into real trouble, like blowing up the lab, he would sharpen take sharpen pencils and throw them up and see if he could stick them in the ceiling. Um, but everybody loved my brother. Everybody loves my brother. He's fun to be around. Uh, you never know quite what to expect from my brother. Um, and there's a theory called multiple intelligences. Have you heard about that theory? Anyway, a professor from Harvard figures there's no less than eight different types of intelligence. And he st based his study on child prodigies, child geniuses. You know, some children can, you know, sound like a, uh, they can play Mozart, you know, on a piano when they're three or something. Ridiculous. Uh, you know, we, they're prodigies. Something in their mind allows them to walk up to a piano and sound like they've had 20 years of, you know, training or more. How does that work? Well, so consequently, uh, the professor said, that's got to be, be something in the mind that allows that child to do that. And maybe it's in all of our minds. But our, some of us don't, that part of our mind doesn't work quite as well as this child prodigy. But it's there, it's there someplace. And that's a type of intelligence. Uh, he looked at other children who are doing calculus when they're four years old or whatever. You know, again, that's ridiculous. No child can learn calculus at age four, but they do. There's some that do. Uh, so they look at that and said, well, there's obviously uh, part of our intelligence that could foster this sort of activity when you're four years old. So we'll put that as one of the multiple intelligences. So he went through and, and analyzed all the different types of intelligences that he could think of and, and see in these child prodigies and came up, like I said, with a list of no fewer than eight types of intelligence. Uh, maybe 13, he says, maybe more. He's, not, he's still working on it, all the different types of intelligence. Well, my brother does not have the same type of intelligence I do. You know, he took one year of college and hated it and left decided to strike out on his own. Um, and I, you know, I get lots of publications. I've written hundreds, well, thousands of newspaper articles, uh, dozens of journal articles. I'm smart. Am I? I don't know. My little brother is worth about 10 or $20 million now because he has social intelligence. I don't have anywhere close to his social intelligence. In fact, most children in school get punished for social intelligence, right? You know that my brother got punished for being socially intelligent and entrepreneurial, so to speak, uh, very active socially. He got in trouble for that. But he's worth a lot of money, and you know he's worth you know at least ten million, and I'm worth like ten dollars. <laughs> so who's intelligent? Me or my brother? In different ways, right? In different ways. We're both intelligent in different ways. I like my life. I like what I've done in, in the world. I really respect him. Uh, he's done some amazing things that are very different than what I would have ever conceived of, ever thought of doing myself. Um, so again, that goes back to could professors, could teachers have predicted my brother's success? No. <laughs> he was blowing up computer, he was blowing up chemistry labs. You know, they, he was the last person they'd think was going to become a, a, a millionaire, a multimillionaire. Um, and how about you, you've probably seen videos by Jack Ma, and he talks about his his earlier earlier years when he was being rejected by universities and he couldn't get a job at 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 McDonald's. 
who would have predicted he was going to become, you know, China's most, biggest success story? Nobody. Nobody. Right? But he had a positive attitude. You can see some of his videos where he's actually, they took video of his, some of his original uh, discussions with possible supporters. And he's so positive. He knows nothing about the internet hardly, except that's cool. I think we can do something with this. He has no technical expertise to speak of, but he had a vision and he had a positive attitude and he got other people to buy into it. And so now he's a multi-billionaire, right? Because he had a positive attitude. That actually, if you thought, looked at it logically, anybody, any logic would have looked at Jack Ma and said, that should be the last person we follow to success. That makes no sense to follow Jack Ma. You know, rejected by university after university, can't get hired by, by McDonald's. Yeah, we, let's follow him. That's the guy we should follow, right? <laughs> That's crazy. That's crazy thinking. Unless you actually did it, and now you're maybe worth a billion dollars too because you supported him in his crazy positive thinking. Um, so attitude is so important in life, so important. So if nothing else you get out of the class, I want you to see reason to be positive. I want you to understand that any of you can can accomplish success. Now we all uh, we all will define success differently. Is my definition of success success personally, the way I implemented it in my life, the same as my brother's definition of success, the way he's implemented it in his life? Very different. I don't. I don't. Do not judge success by, <clears throat> excuse me, by money. I've sacrificed a lot of money along the way. Uh, I had chances to make a lot more money that I walked away from. Um, whereas, uh, you know, he was, while he was uh, extremely socially proactive, he was also convinced that if he worked hard enough, he could do what he did. Um, it took him a long time to get there, by the way. The farm boy becoming a multi-millionaire, excuse me, was, um, he didn't really, he took a big chance on buying another company. And in buying that company, he had to pay $100,000 every year before he could pay himself one penny. He had to pay all of his employees their salaries before he could pay himself one penny. There were times when he wanted to give up, when he thought he was crazy himself. Um, and so it wasn't until 20 years, it took 20 years to pay off that loan. And then he started accumulating wealth at the end of 20 years. So he went through a lot, 20 years of hard, hard work and sometimes desperate times to get to where he's now walked away from the company. He's given it over to his children and he's enjoying, he's still working hard. He's a hard worker by nature. His attitude is being a hard worker. And so he bought a ranch and he's working on the ranch, hard working every day, because he loves it. He loves the ranch and um, I'll show you, if any of you want to, want to uh, um, become my Facebook friends, you'll see my brother, uh, see his ranch. He has, he has a ranch in the foothills of the Blue Mountains in Oregon. And his main activity is taking pictures of all the wildlife that come down from the mountains into his ranch. Um, he shoots, he doesn't shoot them with gun, he shoots them with his camera. And sometimes there are thousands of deer and, and uh, elk in his, and he goes feeds them. <laughs> he wants them to be on his farm. So he, he takes hay out in the middle when it's really snowy, he takes hay out to feed the, the deer and, and elk on his, on his uh, large ranch. But anyway, he loves that. Um, the second thing I say, oops, is um, communication skills. Um, I mentioned that I was in PR marketing for engineering firms and I, I worked primarily for two firms and on their own without me asking many questions, without me prompting them in any way, both of my CEOs in those two large engineering firms uh, told me, Ken, I wish I'd taken more communication courses because while my engineering skills are obviously vital to my success, real success, even in engineering, is, on, is based on communications. 
That's how you become a CEO of an engineering firm, is in communications, not in engineering. But that may help. Your innovation and so forth in engineering may help, but it also means if you're the most innovative engineer in the company, you may be locked in a room somewhere in the back doing your work, computer work. You may never see the light of day. You can be very smart in engineering and not be a CEO. Uh, it is not that the best uh, engineers are not CEOs. They work for CEOs who have natively, in most cases, natively good communication skills um, because they never took very many courses in it. Uh, but they say, and you get the same, I've seen quotes from top business executives too, communication is the, the, the key to, to success in just about any profession. Um, even in medicine, how will communication help? They've done a study and they found that uh, doctors who are, are better communicators are much more successful than the smartest doctors. And in fact, they've even narrowed it down to who gets sued for, for malpractice. In America, everybody sues for malpractice. They don't sue, sue doctors with good personalities. They do sue doctors. They do sue very smart doctors who don't have good personalities. And so you're better off being a good personality doctor than you are being a smart doctor in America. You're less likely to be sued when you, do, when you make a mistake because every doctor makes a mistake. Sometime or another, they make a mistake. That's part of their job, basically. They, it's, there's no way not to make a mistake as a doctor. But the doctors with a good personality don't get sued. Those who are really, really smart and make fewer mistakes, they do get sued. They don't have good enough personalities to be a good doctor, you know, to not get sued. So in every industry in the world, the people are most successful are those with good communication skills. So another reason to take this class is you will be communicating. Uh, I'm not going to, again, I don't want to base it on your native communication skills, but to some degree, it will be influenced by that. I'll be, you'll express yourself a little better. What do I say? But I'm mostly looking for your ideas. You're in the fact that you're self-reflecting in your self-reflective journal, that you're thinking about how to apply these principles. Even if you use bad grammar, you can still get an A, as long as I can understand what you're saying. So you shouldn't try to have bad grammar. You should try to express yourself in a way that I can understand. But if you really express yourself and explain how you can use the concepts we learn in this class, you can get an A in your 3,000 word, ultimately 3,000 word uh, self-reflection journal. Um, because that's what I'm looking for. Are you thinking about it? Are you thinking about how you can apply it? I don't, I'm not caring, I'm trying not to overly bias it based on how wonderfully you write. I'm fighting that, uh, that instinct. I can't say it has no impact, but I try to, to prevent it from having an impact. I want to see you summarizing and self-reflecting, even if it's bad grammar, uh, as long as I can understand it. Just make it understandable, and you can get an A in the class. Computer and other skills in this day and age, kind of flip the script here. For a, for a journalist to be successful, he better learn computers. I've tried very hard to keep myself updated with multimedia. And so part of it is reflecting the fact that I am putting all of my lectures on YouTube. You know, most, of the, most professors don't do that. But every one of my lectures goes on YouTube because I am very interested in, in staying um, up with, with, you know, new technologies. Um, newspapers are now produced uh, with a program called uh, Desktop Publishing. You create the pages ahead of time on your computer and then it goes to press. So even with that, I was, one, you know, I was one of the first users of desktop publishing. And I always pressed myself. In marketing, I learned how to use databases. And in databases, uh, you, you see it now, you take it for granted and seeing it, but you may not know how to do it, is what we call mail merge or email merge. You can take one letter and use a database to put in their names and their, their company, their preferences, anything you want to put in that database. And the big company nowadays have lots of information, information about you. Your purchasing, your purchasing preferences, everything is done now with computers. Um, big data, we call it. Uh, well, I started using my version of big data in, in 1992 uh, and had a big advantage over my competitors in marketing because I knew how to do that stuff. 
and I did stuff with the push of a button that they were taking hours to do. And in fact, mine was better than theirs, even if they took out hours to do it, because uh, I could very quickly customize very complicated, uh, very complicated forms that the government and other big uh, organizations demanded of an engineering firm. Because uh, all that information is in my database, I could say, let's choose out of all the hundreds of projects we've done, let's show them examples of these 12. And I could just go in and say, well, we'll choose that one and that one and this one and this one and this one and this one, hit a button, it's gone. And they wouldn't do that because they were still typing theirs. Um, so all my life I've tried to stay abreast of, of computer advances and so forth. I basically you know, grew up in the computer age and I've tried to stay abreast of it. And you need to do the same thing if you want to be successful, I think. It, because among other things, like for example, we're just talking about writing. Um, you know, there are, you know, programs online that can help you become a much better writer. And those of you who are struggling with your writing should be go to, going to Grammarly.com, letting Grammarly.com help you with your writing. Uh, if, if your writing is important to your grade, you better go to Grammarly.com. Or maybe there's, there's something else that's just as good, but Grammarly is the one that's doing most of the advertising right now, and I've heard good things about it. And I think probably a lot of the best students are using Grammarly.com, whilst a lot of the worst students are saying, what? What are you talking about? Okay. You need to use technology to help you. There's nothing against the rules to use Grammarly.com on your essays and on your, your self-reflective journal. Nothing. Use it. Um, Memory-based learning is, to me, the lowest form of education. Even though I am, I am uh, offering, you know, even though I'm trying to go to uh, a system that will be based mostly on a final exam, uh, I'm going to see all the questions you're going to see in the weekly, weekly quizzes. And so if you take the time to memorize it, you can. But the main reason I'm doing it is because look at all the people in the class. Again, for me to um, base and in the fact that you're all IT and business and whatever your majors are, you're not journalism majors. And so I think it's unfair to you to have your self-reflective journal be worth 60% or 70% of your, your grade. I just don't think that's fair. Uh, so I'd rather it be worth a lot less than that, uh, maybe even 30%. <clears throat> But even in that 30%, I want to be able to grade easily. I want to separate your final grades based on your final exam, which will include some essay. But I think that's uh, better than you know, having 70% of your grade coming from a writing project. I just don't see that being appropriate for this class. And by the very nature of it, as I said earlier, how am I supposed to grade all of your you know, if you're, if, if some of you are doing the minimum 3,000, but others are doing 9,000 or 12,000 words, how am I supposed to really fairly grade your final journals in the last, you know, during the final exam period? I, I, ju I just have to, I, well, let me put it this way. It's, it's not as bad as I'm saying it is because when you are, when you take a final, when you take a, a, a multiple choice exam, are they are they examining everything you know in your mind? No. So a multiple choice exam is still, it is essentially um, surveying your mind. It's it's going, it's it's asking a bunch of questions, thinking that if you can answer these 100 questions, then you're more likely to be able to answer another thousand of them. But it's not asking you every question for everything you know in your mind. Not even everything about the class. They're, they're giving you a kind of a random selection of questions they think will fairly uh, tell them what's in your brain. And that's how, when I had to grade it by using the final uh, uh, portfolio as the, as the main uh, predictor or the main basis of grading, I had to do the same thing. So out of 15 weeks, I, I read five weeks of each one. Uh, I couldn't read 15 weeks worth of, you know, I, I could read five weeks. And so probably it was fairly fair. I still don't feel comfortable with it. Um, but I'm basically taking a random selection of what people wrote 
and grading it based on that. So it's not quite as bad as saying it's worthless, but I, I'm not comfortable with it. And I don't think that, I, I think you all would rather have a, a, a objective based uh, exam than me grading you on your writing. Maybe some of you in business and stuff might say, yeah, because we're, we're PR people or whatever. Your, your writing skills are better than other people. But I, overall, it's not fair, I don't think. Anyway, and memory, ultimately, what you learn in college, the only thing you'll remember out of all of it, I had a student, my worst, maybe one of my worst students overseas anyway, wrote me a letter. Um, she was in a PR class of mine in Kazakhstan. And it's probably the, my favorite letter I ever got from a student. Uh, she said, uh, I really appreciate what you taught me. You probably, I don't know why you passed me. You shouldn't have passed me. I didn't do the work. Uh, she didn't do very much work. She skipped a lot, a lot of stuff. I don't know why you passed me, but you're the, you're the only class that has helped me in my real life. Because um, you did teach me communications. You taught me some aspects of communication, then it turned out she was a gymnast. She she uh, was not a, an Olympic gym, uh, gymnast, uh, but her her partner in, in gymnastic was a gold medal winner from Russia. And uh, she was, uh, uh, she did uh, perform in the London uh, Olympics as part of the uh, final ceremonies and stuff. She was good, but she wasn't the greatest student. <laughs> Uh, but she's a good gymnast, and uh, but anyway, she started her own gymnastics school, and she said, you know, what I taught her about PR made all the difference in the world, her success as a gymnastics teacher. Um, and so even though I thought she learned nothing, and yes, I do remember I should have given her an F. I don't like giving Fs. And so I, I gave her a D probably just to say, okay, this obviously isn't real relevant to you right now. Go on, go on. Uh, you're again. I don't believe the grades are predictors of success. So why do I care? I'll give you a D. You can go on with what's important to you. So she went on to BK and started her own gymnastics school, and she used what I taught her to be successful as a gymnastics teacher uh, and director, or whatever her, her uh, actual title was. And she's still doing that. And she still writes me once in a while and telling me how much she appreciates me. So yeah. I, that's one of my favorite ones because she was such a bad student. So, but she said she remembered nothing else. Out of all the class she took, she didn't remember anything, remember anything else. And the reason why you don't is if it's not important to you, you just don't remember it. That's part of our memory. In that building that, that conceptual framework, if it's not important to us, guess where it goes? In our mental trash bucket. We don't keep it. You have too many things to keep up there, to keep everything up there. And so if it's not important to us, it's gone. And so most of your college education is wasted on you, in a, in a sense. I'm exaggerating. But in a sense, most of your college education is wasted, wasted. The problem is we don't know which part. Part of it will be important to you. And so you're going through lots of classes, and some of it will be important, and some of it won't be. You'll throw 75% of it away. Uh, but the 25% will help form your future. We just don't know which 25%. If we do that, we could just give you the 25% and not waste your time with the other 75%. But we don't know. You know, this gymnastics student didn't know it'd be my PR class that was the only thing that was worth a remembering. Turned out it was. Uh, so I'm glad I had I had a role in that. So I don't really like memory. I like to in my major classes, especially as do it, do it, do it. Because I think while doing it, uh, you really fix that into your mind. Uh, and you figure out what's important, what's successful, how to, how to express things, how to do things. Uh, so I'm a do it sort of professor. I have to do a lot of lecturing in this class, but I want you to be involved. OK, we're about out of time. But here's something to think about. I will put on some uh, videos for you to watch. Uh, I'll go to that slide in just a second. But think about this. In fact, this might be what you put into your first. I will create a uh, self-reflective journal entry for you, uh, maybe tonight, maybe uh, sometime in the next couple of days anyway. Uh, and you can reflect on this question. 
Do you love what you're good at, or are you good at what you love? What do you think? Any comments right now? Which is which is the case? Are you do you love what you're good at, or are you good at what you love? I'll give you my answer. You know what I was good at in high school? Math and science. I loved math and science, but I didn't love it as much as I loved the idea of changing people's lives. And I didn't see myself changing people's lives with math and science. Maybe I could have in some way, but I didn't see that. My vision of myself was to be a teacher, to be a journalist, to communicate important ideas. And so that was my weakest area in high school, uh, was English. It wasn't real weak. You know, don't get me wrong, I was good at it. I was not great at it. That was my weakest area. And so I had to do a, work, a lot of work at it. I uh, become really a good journalist. And I don't know if I'm a good educator, but I'm a good journalist. Uh, it's up to you to decide whether I'm a good educator, but I try to at least, as an educator, the most important thing to me are those things I was talking about before. Help you with your attitude, help you with your soft skills, help you with the things that will actually make a difference in your life, and then cover the rest as I'm required to do. Um, the stuff that might be memory oriented, eh, I have to do it. But that's not the most, I know that's not the most important part. I know that's the least important part. All the other stuff is more important. Um, anyway, um, it is hard to remember stuff um, that is not useful and relevant to you, and that also goes with what you love. If you really love something, you're going to remember it. Yeah, much more likely. If you hate it, you remember it? No, that's part of the rejection process. Ah, oh, I hate that. There it goes, into the wastebasket. You might remember it long enough. You, I'm really good at short-term memory. That's why I'm a good student. I can really cram for a short for an exam. And I know it's worthless, but I know how to play the game. And so when I, when I uh, you know, have classes that are basically memory-based, uh, I take really good notes. I suggest you do the same. Uh, in fact, if you take notes in here, then your self-reflective journal will be almost written. You already have written down a bunch of stuff. And so that'll be easy then. Uh, so I suggest taking notes and then just transferring some of it to your self-reflective journal. It's done. Um, but also in your writing, writing is kinesthetic learning. As you write something, it embeds itself better. It's a different type of learning. And so uh, it's important. Some of us learn better by hearing, some by seeing. But one way of learning, and all of them do get involved with it, kinesthetic learning is really, is really useful. So as you're taking notes, you're embedding it into your brain, whether you like it or not, a little bit, because you're writing it. You are communicating it right there, sitting in class. You're embedding it into your mind. Uh, but then I take those notes, and before the exam comes up, I transfer, I look at those notes, and I put them on three by five cards, uh, three inch by five inch cards or bigger, whatever, but cardstock cards that I can write on. I make basically, uh, uh, what do you call that? Um, I'm losing my English. Being overseas, I don't talk about everything all the time, and so I start, I'm losing some of my vocabulary. Terrible. Uh, uh, oh, well. Stupid, it's easy. Um, anyway, uh, I just make it out of cardstock and, and I write, I abbreviate it, I, I write it more clearly, I write it in those cards, and then because it really is meaningful and it's really important to me to get a good grade, I can stay up all night studying. I may collapse the next day, but I can stay up all night because I have adrenaline going. It's important enough to me for my adrenaline to pump my adrenaline. So I can stay up all night, or at least most of the night, studying my 3 by 5 cards, and everything I so I learned kinesthetically. Uh, I took a class on in my master's program. I took a class called communications research, and I was kind of scared of that class because everybody said that's the hardest class. Well, that's a hard class. That's the hardest class of all the master's courses. That's that's the hard one. But I used my technique that I was just describing, um, and maybe because I am a little bit science oriented anyway and math oriented, I can get into statistics and stuff. Okay, uh, but whatever it was. The final exam had 181 points. 
I got 179. The next highest was 126 out of a full class of grad students. So I beat the beat the next highest grade by more than a third, or about a third, a little bit less than a third, I guess. But I can cram. I'm a great cramper. That means nothing. <laughs> it really in the real world that means nothing. I can't. I basically I don't remember hardly any of that stuff, right? Isn't that true for all of us? You cram for a class, how much do you remember? You know, cram for an exam, eh, you remember long enough to get your grade, and then you, there you go, it's gone. It wasn't worth keeping. Um, so that's another reason why I'm skeptical about GPA, because I know most of the stuff I crammed, I don't remember anymore, it's worthless. It always was worthless. It was worthless before I ever took the exam, except it got me an A. That's all. Uh, it was worth getting an A. But that means nothing in real life. Whatever. So um, I just uh, I'm going to uh, I will put I will post. Uh, eh, just went too far. Um, still too far. I'll put this on Moodle regardless. Uh, my mouse did not seem to be working right now, nor even the. Okay, well, anyway, this whole PowerPoint will be, the whole PowerPoint will be put up in PDF format on, on Moodle, um, and uh, this slide will be one of them. You, you don't, uh, I will delete some of these because I didn't show them today, or I'll, I'll postpone them to next week or whatever. What I leave on it will be worth about, will be, well, I'm not, uh, how do I say this? Uh, next Monday, those of you that come back, no, I won't do it next Monday. That doesn't make any sense. A week from Monday, the material that I have you look at this week will be among that which you'll have in a quiz. And my intention this semester is to give the quiz in class. I want you to bring your mobile devices or your computers, whatever you have, to access Moodle. The quizzes will be on Moodle. And so I'm doing that for two reasons. One is that I will actually include some, some questions, some fairly easy questions about what we talk about in class. So I want to motivate you to listen in class. You're not going to learn anything if you don't listen. And so uh, the quizzes you, you take starting in two weeks uh, will include some from the very class you're sitting in at that time. So you better listen or you can't answer those questions on the quiz, right? So the last 15 minutes or so of the quiz or the class, you'll have like maybe 10 multiple choice questions answered. Some of them will be from what we learn from these videos. Some will be from next week, and then some will be from the very class we're in uh, two weeks from now when we take that first quiz. Um, so, uh, and that the other reason I do that is because a lot of students skip class and then they sign for each other. And I can kind of tell between, you know, 60 students and 20 students. I can kind of tell the difference. But there's not much I can do about it if all I'm doing is if you all are signing for, for each other. But there is something I can do about it if I give a quiz at the end of the class and you don't do the quiz. You miss that point, you know, two points, whatever I decide to make it with. It won't be worth a lot, one or two points, uh, but it'll be enough that you should pay attention, come to class, and bring your mobile device with you to do that 15 minute quiz at the end of, of starting in two weeks, every class. You can have, you'll have like 10 questions, maybe fewer. Um, and uh, the important part about that, another important part about it is you should go back into your quiz and copy the questions. Why? For what I said so far, why should you copy the questions? That's right. The final exam is based on the questions in the weekly quizzes. 
you might think this is duh, but in the last class, the reason why they switched the class was so many of my students were flunking the final exam. I had to give them, I had to make up bonus points for them to keep them from failing the class because they never did the weekly quizzes when I had them do them outside of class. That's pretty stupid. You know, I tell them you need, and so there was almost a 100% perfect correlation between those who got A's and uh, as opposed to those who flunked the, the final exam. It was who did the quizzes in between? Who did the weekly quizzes? It does, that should not take a, a, a genius to figure out that if the final exam is based on your weekly quizzes, what should you do? You should learn the question, you should learn the answers to the weekly quizzes. You should at least take them. And the other thing, you should copy them. And so when you're done taking them in Moodle, it will show you, if, I'm not going to give you the correct answers because I want you to have to work a little bit for it. But you will be able to, uh, it will tell you which ones you got wrong probably. I'll probably let you have that much of a notice which ones you got wrong. So then you can figure out which one, what's the right answer from there. So I'm going to make you work a little bit, but, and I will maybe reword some of the questions in the final exam. But you will have essentially, other than the essay questions won't be in the weekly quizzes, but you can kind of figure out, I and mean, the essay questions are going to be, you know, not real hard, but um, your final exam shouldn't be hard if you're taking the weekly quizzes. So that's another reason to give them in class. Uh, can I ask that the final exam only MCQ questions? How, how much? Yeah, just the final exam only Um, well, it will be, I think are subjective, basically. Uh, so there will be essays. I can't give everybody an A in the final exam. Uh, the, the university won't let me because that'll, I can't give a, a, an A to everybody in the class. I would like to be able to do that. I can't. The university won't let me. They will kick back my grades if I try to do that. And so I can't do that. And so that's why one reason why I do have essay questions on the final exam. Uh, they, they would worth, be worth you know, quite a bit of that final exam, but it will help me differentiate between students because I have to, I'm required to. Uh, so, yes, there will be uh, essays on the final exam and those will be, they will not be objective. Um, so, okay. Any other questions? We are out of time. Uh, you know, so I can answer for you. I will be, uh, I'll stay up here if anybody wants to come. Uh, one thing I urge you to do, is ask your questions in front of class so that everybody can get the answer. Okay, I thank you for asking some questions. Because most of you won't. Okay, we have one proactive student here sitting in the front asking questions. And the rest of you aren't. So guess what? He's on my good side. He's really on my good side because he's doing the work for you. Uh, he's being proactive. And it's important that we that you ask the questions. And if I have to answer the same question 20 times, that's frustrating. But it's also frustrating that some of you who have asked me those 20 times the same question, well, for you got the answer, but the, another 40 students never asked the question and never heard the answer. And it was an important question. And so I have a bunch of students not doing very well because they never bothered to ask, answer, ask the question in class and they never heard it when you asked the question. So we have real proactive, we have semi-proactive that come talk to me personally. And we have those that are inactive <laughs> students, and they have a harder time. And I don't want them. I want them to learn. So uh, you're really doing all of us a favor if you ask your questions in class. And then I can answer it for everybody, and everybody that's paying attention will know. And it saves me some time answering the same question 20 times. But more importantly, it gives everybody the answer uh, so that, you know, so they can benefit from it. Because I know. I would say there's no stupid questions. That's not true. There's lots of stupid questions, but they're still important to ask. Uh, a lot of the stupid questions are the ones that people are obviously not listening. Um, but um, but those are the ones I consider stupid. Why didn't you listen? I said this. I spent 20 minutes talking about this, and you asked me the question. That what I would consider a stupid question. A, a question where you're paying attention and and I haven't explained it very well. That's a good question. Uh, because I'm not a perfect teacher. 
And so I, I, I invite those questions, those challenges. If you disagree with me, I, I invite you to challenge me. Uh, like I said, I'm, your challenges are kind of a classroom version of my studying quantum physics, okay? Your questions make me think, and maybe I will change my mind. I'm trying to keep my mind open to new ideas. So challenge me. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, I'll put up, like I said, I'll put all this up on, and including the lectures today will be, the lecture going to YouTube, will be embedded into, uh, into Moodle, the PowerPoint will go into Moodle. Uh, everything you need will pretty much be in Moodle. Okay, thank you. Let me just change this real quick. I, mean, I don't know why this isn't working today. Okay.